I remember using their software and after five years, I just was told a new command that would have saved me a year of my life. Hello and welcome to the business of architecture. My name is Ryan Willard and I'll be the host for today's episode. And I'm very excited to introduce our esteemed guest, Taylor Schmidt, who originally hails from the vibrant city of Chicago. Uh, Taylor's journey has taken him from the heart of the Midwest to the technological hub of Silicon Valley. Taylor's passion for innovation led him to immerse himself in the realm of artificial intelligence back in 2022. But before that, let's a little, have a little bit of a look, because before venturing into the realm of AI, Taylor's roots lie deep within a third generation construction family, instilling in him a profound appreciation for the craft of construction, architecture and design from a very young age. His pursuit of architectural excellence led him to the esteemed halls of the School of Architecture at the University of Notre Dame. Here, he not only learnt the principles of classical architecture, but also honed his skills in the intricate art of furniture design. Taylor's professional journey saw him traversing through the bustling landscape of both Chicago and Los Angeles, where he lent his expertise to four distinguished high-end residential firms. However, true to the spirit of innovation, he eventually charted his own path, founding his architecture design consulting practice. But here's where the plot thickens. In 2022, Taylor embarked on an exciting new venture, temporarily shelving his traditional architectural pursuits to embark on a groundbreaking startup named Corbu. With Corbu, Taylor envisions a future where architecture transcends its conventional boundaries, acting not merely as a design service, but as a genuine design assistant. Through the fusion of AI and architectural prowess, Corbu aims to elevate both the architect's creative process and the client's experience to unprecedented heights. In this episode, we talk a lot about the potential of AI, how Corbu is integrating AI, the future of architectural practice that is using AI very powerfully to unlock new business innovations as well as design workflow innovations. We talk about some really wonderful ideas of how AI can be used to assist in the marketing and relationship building of an architecture practice as well as creating um, visual representations and actually being used as a, as a design tool. I think it's really important for us as architects to be embracing the world of AI. The founder of ChatGPT, Sam Altman, recently said that he can envision in the future billion dollar companies being run by a single person. Now, that's quite an extraordinary thought. And I posit that here for what could be possible for architecture. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Taylor Schmidt of Corbu. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Hello, listeners. We hope you're enjoying our show. We love bringing you these insightful conversations, but we couldn't do it without the support of our amazing sponsors. If you're a business owner or know someone who would be an excellent fit for our audience, we'd love to hear from you. Partnering with us means your brand will reach over 40,000 engaged listeners each month. Interested in becoming a sponsor? Please send us an email at support at businessofarchitecture.com. Taylor, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? I'm good, Ryan. Happy to be here. Exciting to be uh, speaking with you. Um, now, you've had a very uh, interesting career, um, a, a departure from traditional architectural edu education and the architectural path, um, and now you're um, a, a a startup founder, a maestro of the world of artificial intelligence and how it's integrating into architectural practice um, and how, you know, um, the profession can be utilizing and capitalizing on this kind of the next revolution, if you like, of, technolo of technology uh, and the potential that it can unlock. And it's an interesting conversation to have because, you know, I speak to a lot of architects at the moment and um, certainly some of the more mature 
clients that we have, um, you know, it's not uncommon for us when we look into a business, we'll see lots of antiquated workflows and ways of production. I mean, even if we just look at CAD, you know, I'll often say that when a founder of an architecture practice sets up their practice, their CAD education tends to kind of stop. And then it gets, and then that, that way of doing stuff that happened in 2011, okay, kind of gets magnified and the rest of the team gets trained in doing it like that. And they never really unlock the potential of the software or technology that's available to them. And, you know, this is, this is actually quite a significant uh, issue for a lot of practices where, you know, what you can do with a team of two to three people now in 2024 versus what you could do 15 years ago is is absolutely extraordinary so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that in a moment but let's start with your own pathway and ha- number one how how would you describe what it is that you do today and number two how did you get there yeah amazing so many things to talk about today so super excited um, my own pathway so it is a very natural uh, process to, to get to where we are quite literally, literally just grew up in a construction family so really around architecture from my earliest memories uh, the running joke in the family is of course you know at five years old I was kind of told this is what you do when you're building stuff and by the time I was seven I realized if I become an architect I can start telling my family what to do and that kind of set the tone <laughs> for how to how to live life right because if, if you decide really early I'm going to be an architect like many of us you know, your, your path is kind of set. And I was lucky to have a neighbor who was an architect that kind of guided me down that path. I was sketching, you know, before high school, kind of drawing up spaces and becoming very spatially aware. Uh, so all of that kind of led me to a great education in architecture, I was working mostly in high end residential, both in Chicago and LA. And then in 2021, started my own practice. And in that practice is where I first discovered AI. And this at the time was just using Dolly, which is an mm-hmm. image generator to go from text to image to almost act as like a super Pinterest, uh, which of course was very helpful. But something I noticed is really this is a shift in the way we design. Because as soon as you have that idea, you can start to generate it and then talk about it. So that was like all the poison I needed to really get going on a deep dive into AI. And my blue collar jeans kind of kicked in a year later, ended up moving out to Silicon Valley from Chicago and just took a a super deep dive into AI, the, the whole world of startups. And I thought to myself, okay, if this technology is changing the way I design, then I'm probably not the only one who's going to be going through this. Uh, What I noticed, though, is there there weren't really tools specifically built for architects. And my curiosity got the better of me to understand, like, okay, I know we have Adobe, which is like design tools for everyone, right? And within architecture, there's Enscape, which is like a verticalized tool for, for architects. So although there's these horizontal AI tools for every designer, there's got to be these verticalized AI tools for architects. Um, and I couldn't really find I couldn't find anything that I liked for my design process. Uh, so started to actually build the, the software. I was hoping to use my own, mm-hmm. uh, my own practice. And that's kind of like the ultimate goal here. I, I think at some point I do want to go back into the profession. Uh, this is just um, a, a current opportunity that I think someone should do. And mm-hmm. I, I do see myself as having the skill sets uh, and, and the drive uh, the ambition and the youth to to tackle this problem. Well, let's let's have a little look, and then at the kind of things that AI is offering in architectural workflows currently, um, and 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 in your own explorations, what were you using it for? And and things like Mid Journey and Dali, we we've, we've kind of started to see architects use these things. I must say that it doesn't take much. Certainly, if your if your eye is saturated with a lot of these images, that you can start to pick out AI cliches, if you like. Um, maybe not to a, somebody who's not looking at architectural images; it's a bit more hard to distinguish. I mean, I must say, it is it is, you know, the, the quality of images from Dali or, or Mid Journey is is pretty extraordinary. But they do have a kind of AI flavor to them. Um, what sorts of things are you seeing like uh, where architects can really be using AI and you know on the and the some of the software that you've been developing where does it depart from things like midjourney and dali yeah great great question so you're tackling uh, almost the exact problem we're solving with with what we're building 
which for, for context, uh, the, the software is called Corbu. Mm-hmm. And part of the idea is, yes, to name it after Le Corbusier, who helped pioneer modern design, and we're pioneering that next, next wave of architectural design. Um, but also touching on this idea of architects having a real design assistant, which is helping them design uh, versus the software that uh, you're facilitating. Mm-hmm. I think there's going to be a beautiful back and forth between the architect and the designer. Um, and, and there's a great book um, called The Architecture Machine from the 1960s. I, I think By the author is like, yes, yes, yes. Nicholas yeah, Nicholas. Ponte. yeah. Yes, right. yes. So if you haven't read that yet, I, I really encourage people to kind of understand what people were thinking in the 60s because I think today it's actually coming to fruition. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, it's a beautiful future of architecture. Right. So the, the, the problem that, that we noticed is that a lot of these foundational models like Dolly and Midjourney uh, didn't touch on the needs of the reality of architects, which is we're dealing with real spaces. Uh, so the, the foundational model that does address those issues is stable diffusion mm-hmm. and specifically a paper called ControlNet, which allows the designer to actually keep control of the input geometry to then affect the output, staying true to that geometry. Mm-hmm. So what we're working on is allowing designers to take the existing real world geometry from either a renovation project or the 3D model that they made, and then have that act as the base for the rendering. Because like the classic, you know, mid journey is like a cathedral kitchen. And it looks like a cathedral kitchen and it's beautiful, <laughs> but that, that's not realistic. It's, it's really just a toy. And maybe it helps you kind of, you know, uh, build up your creativity in, in your mind's eye of what that could look like. Uh, but the truth is, sometimes we just need a normal looking kitchen, right? Or a kitchenette. And when, when you're working, <laughs> right, buildable and uh, within budget. Uh, so what we really want to emphasize is, uh, since so much of design is facilitated by, by the image, we do agree that AI can impact that visualization process, but the outputs have to be uh, rooted in the reality of the project versus this fantastical uh, output that doesn't necessarily, that wouldn't necessarily ever be built. It's just something to um, help with your imagination. Let, let's take a step back, actually, and I'd be very interested to hear how do you define what artificial intelligence actually is? And it was very interesting that you brought up the book, um, The Architecture Machine, ne- Negroponte. It was a book that I was, um, he was a professor at the Architectural Association. Um, and that when I was at university, I was very interested in second order cybernetics, Gordon Pask, Cedric Price, all these characters that were associated with the architectural association and the idea of, in, of what intelligent architecture looks like, interactive architecture and what were the, and that, and it was very interesting because they were speculating about the possibility of machine derived architecture. And now where at this point where we're using the word artificial intelligence to describe something. What is that something in your mind? Theme of books, I do want to bring up The Opposable Mind by Mm -hmm. Roger Martin. And he dives into this this discussion around integrative thinking and looks at great leaders in the business profession and how what they were excellent at is taking two opposing ideas, mm-hmm. synthesizing it, and coming up with a third idea that takes the best from both. So instead of A or B, you kind of create your own path for C. Uh, and the overlap there for designers is that's quite literally the design process. Like, that is our entire education, right? Mm-hmm. You look at you know the work of some precedents in, in Amsterdam, and you apply it to another work in Berlin, and then you come up with a, a new design. <laughs> Uh, and, and there's contextual architecture and the fabric buildings of our of our place. It's looking at uh, the, you know the buildings around your site and then incorporating new elements. So when I look at artificial intelligence, I can't help but also acknowledge what it's really good at is taking these opposing ideas, synthesizing it, and making a new idea. Right, that cathedral kitchen. Mm-hmm. Not too many people have probably sketched that out. But if you go on to Midjourney and type out, show me a cathedral kitchen, it actually looks pretty good. So I, I think it's important. <clears throat> I think it's important for us as designers to lean into the creative touch that this technology can bring mm-hmm. instead of a shy away from it, because that's kind of our superpower. 
right? Like as designers, we are open to new ideas mm -hmm. and we understand that you need the bad ideas to get to the good ideas. So when you look at professions like healthcare or law and you overlap AI to that, sometimes that's an issue. If you get mm -hmm. these hallucinations in law, well, maybe someone goes to jail. Like that, 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 could, that could be pretty bad. But in design, if you get these hallucinations about you know, a window being misplaced on the wall, mm. you could look at that critically or you could be like, does that work? And, and I think artificial intelligence, especially generative AI, which is the actual act of coming up with these new ideas, is really here to help uh, act as an extension of our thoughts and an extension of our hand. Mm -hmm. um, not here to compete with us, right? Because it still needs these inputs from the designer. Um, it's just here to speed up the creative process, which almost allows generative AI to act as its linchpin. Because mm -hmm. if you're not using it, then your feedback loop stays what it is today. But as soon as you start incorporating into your process, you get a faster feedback loop. Mm -hmm. And what we know from design is that the more the more feedback we get, the better the design gets. And um, I, I th this was something that you know, I really wish I had as a student and as a, as a young professional because um, the, the value add and, and the efficiencies it brings is allowing you to focus on what actually matters in the project. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So the, the kind of capacity that what you're saying here that, that AI has is to be able to be part of this iterative process of design and almost has this capacity to speed up iteration and feed us back ideas, be part of this kind of, you know, the, the, the analogy you use there of the, the A-B interaction. You know, one person's got an idea A, another person's got an idea B. Those two come together and you get C. And that actually AI is, is, the, is either the other person or is the blender, if you like, for creating the, the C. So it, I, I, what's interesting is that the word artificial intelligence, like the, how we're languaging it this often causes a lot of fear for architects because if you don't know what it is or, or or some of its mechanisms then there is the apprehension that it is a kind of new entity or sentient machinery that's coming over to wipe away the the need of the architect do you think that's you know is that an accurate fear to have or is it gross misunderstanding of what it actually is and is artificial intelligence not really that intelligent it's more like a very sophisticated search engine that's kind of able to you know th you use the word generative as well i think that's very interesting because that's what's different about it than a search engine right yeah absolutely i think there's two ways to think about that that answer uh one is you can look at the profession uh on this long timeline right and one could argue that there has been a trend of uh, the architect moving beyond just designer. Because if you think back to like Renaissance Rome, right, the architect was the master builder and Brunelleschi designed the dome of Florence, but also the scaffolding to get a bit. And then over time, you know, where we are today is we've really siloed these different uh, aspects of, of being the architect. You know, you have the builder and you have the designer and you have the design consultant and the lighting consultant. So I, I think one could view that as, you know, AI is almost that uh, impetus of the pendulum swing that's going to push the profession back towards being the master builder or the architect plus something. And we see that with, uh, you know, architect and developer, right? Architect and real estate agent. Uh, design build is common now. And I think one could argue that this is really uh, a time where AI is just speeding up that, that, that swing of the pendulum. And you almost have to start doing architecture plus something else because uh, that's just been a, a race to the bottom for so long. Um, so I think that's, that's one way of viewing it. So on, on the other train of thought, I think a lot of designers understand that architecture is more than just the pretty picture. Mm. And if you get AI to generate all these new images and all these new ideas, you know, it still has to be rooted in reality. And there still has to be that translation of what the client likes about that image back into the reality of their budget and the site constraints. Uh, so I think, I think inherently as a designer, you know, because we spend so much time on uh, that, that beautiful sketch or that beautiful watercolor or 10 hours in Enscape to get this perfect rendering, uh, 
we see an image get generated in two seconds and, and we get concerned because we know the effort that it took to get there. Uh, but I, I think if you get beyond that initial fear um, or maybe even jealousy to some extent, you understand that there's so much more to design than just a pretty picture. And that's the value you're bringing to your own clients. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, the, the two modes of thought here are AI could be accelerating this transition of the architect needing to do more than just design, um, mm -hmm. or AI is here to remind us that architecture is more than just the pretty picture. And there's so much more into the profession that goes on uh, beyond just generating any ideas from Pinterest. Because if you do view images just as a super Pinterest, I mean, historically, clients have come to us with images saying, hey, I like this. Uh, we all know we're on Architectural Digest looking at the top uh, architects and the work they've did and applying it to our design. So I, I think maybe there's just going to be more of that mm -hmm. uh, in, in the idea of transferring um, transferring design decisions through the image. Uh, but I, I, I'm, I'm open to how uh, AI is actually going to impact the profession, uh, of course, with the lens of it's, it's going to be good either way. I, I I think it's really important for these sorts of um, dialogues to be kind of spoken about in the architecture industry. I remember when I was at university and we were talking about the potential of an artificial intelligence in architecture or an interactive architecture, or what did that mean? This idea of could there be a machine that actually spits out buildings for you? And Negroponte kind of starts to point towards actually the complexity with which, you know, this is what architects do is we're dealing with unknowns and we're dealing with huge amounts of complexity. And a lot of these decisions are happening kind of intuitively and based from our own paradigm that we're living in and bringing to a project, which is a very human thing to do. And any tool is going to help us make decision-making processes and what we're starting to see AI being available for is really putting the architect, like you say, back in the seat of being master builder and it just empowering an architect to become an editor or a curator of ideas and can expand the scope of being able to deal with more complexity as opposed to it just being like a formula of like, here's, here's exactly the right solution for the, for the site. Because it's doesn't it's not as it's never as simple as that, you know. I remember going to university and I was looking my first year. I was naively looking for a book that was called How to Design a Building, you know. And I just I just wanted a, a simple like four step formula. Here's what you do to design the building, <laughs> and right. it didn't ex and it didn't exist and it didn't exist. And that I always think back to that because it was in my as a young student. I just. I just was like, where's the beginner's book? Where's the, <laughs> where's the one, two, three? All of this stuff the tutors are talking about is so convoluted and complex. And there isn't such a, such a book. Um, and the, the, the consideration that goes into any site and also the complexity of, you know, of human interactions is what makes it, it so interesting. So in your, your, your startups um, uh, in Corbu, tell us a little bit about how that came into being um, and the, some of the processes that you've gone through to building it to where it is now. And it's, and it's kind of overarching mission. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, there was maybe six months of really trying to figure out what's going to be that initial use case for designers. And it started out being a, a questionnaire that you would send to a client and they'd answer questions about what they like, what they don't like, and then AI would generate these ideas. Um, turns out that wasn't the best approach. A, a lot of designers want that initial control when working with their clients. And it, it's been really interesting kind of having our, our own ideas about how AI might be affect, how AI might uh, improve the process for designers and then actually getting that in front of practicing architects and getting their feedback. So one thing that we did was actually looked uh, we looked at the history to kind of understand what, what might be happening here. Uh, and one thing that came up was uh, at the advent of the photograph, there was some initial backlash with designers and photography. It's really interesting because at the time, you know, let's think back to the etchings of beautiful architecture, right? The person doing that sketch or that etching, you know, they had freedom to add better landscape 
right? Or to add people into the view that really added to it. And, and you know, the classic birds, right? But as soon as you do photography, what you're getting is a realistic representation. Mm. And what if a photographer comes around and takes a picture of the building before the landscape is built in? So, you know, going back, this was like maybe a hundred years, it, the, there was um, a pause to incorporate photographs into the process of architecture. So overlapping that with what we're dealing today is this idea of uh, these AI models. And one thing that we're curious about and working towards is this idea that the same way today, companies have photographs that represent their work that they then show to clients that then helps them get more work, which the photograph also makes up their own style, right? This is what we're striving towards mm -hmm. for, for the Pinterest board. Uh, we think this might also be what happens with these own AI models that have been trained to understand the style of a firm. So what that looks like is internally these models Mm. are being used by the design team. And after six, 12 months, what's happening is, you know, each designer is saying, I, I like this image for this project. And you're getting all this data that can then be used to retrain that model. And over time, you actually get a pretty good representation of what that firm describes as good design. Because uh, the ambiguity here is the way you describe classical architecture is different than the way I describe classical architecture. And the, the truth is, the way it is described is with an image or with a sketch or with an idea. So what, what Corbu is providing is a platform for firms to start training their own AI model. And that's something that's super effective internally to, of course, partake in the visualization process with renderings and ideation. But over time, we see that there's probably going to be an interaction of different stakeholders with that firm's model. And, you know, think back to the, the 1960s uh, and photographs of works of architecture were only shown to the client when you went in the firm and they would flip through the book with you. Right. You know, this is our best work. And, and there's still some of this, uh, you know, projects being under NDA uh, mm -hmm. or not every project is shown on the website through, through photographs, but often it is your best work and you are promoting it. Uh, so we think right now there's going to be some hesitation with models being used externally that represent the firm. But over time, that's going to go down. And the comfort level of letting others interact with your own artificial uh, designer, your, your own uh, core boo, let's call it, yeah. uh, is going to allow the architect's client to partake in that design process and have a more delightful experience. Mm -hmm. uh, it's going to allow, uh, you know, in RFPs, there's not oh. going to. So, so oh, hold on a minute. So, so you're, you're suggesting like a, like a, like a prospective client could come and have a conversation with Corbu and, and start generating ideas in the style of, if you like, I use the word style kind of loosely here, but I, I kind of, it will start ideating an approach that is akin to how this, the, the office works as a kind exactly. of way. exactly exactly and if that's Whoa. the future if that's the future you're ready for come talk to us Whoa. not everyone is ready for that future and that future might not ever happen but sure. i think if you look at history and understand how the photograph was used yeah ai models it's the same thing and some people are ready and excited for that others mm -hmm. think that is completely ridiculous and i think that's mm -hmm. a really good sign that we're moving in the right direction. I love that as a as as an idea, as a kind of way of, you know, um, proactively prospecting with clientele and having a having a kind of AI generated assistant, if you like, that is able to you know provide value for prospective clients and help them look at problems and help them think about stuff, and then. You know, it, it draws you in as the consultant, and it positions you in a it positions you in a very powerful place to start doing that kind of stuff. That's that's very intelligent. Mm -hmm. There's a company I don't know if you know them in the UK called Bryden Wood, and Bryden Wood 
uh, they uh, they're they're kind of very heavy with their computational design. They've been going for a long time. They do a lot of very um, process. They work for a lot of very heavy process driven clientele. So, infrastructure, airports, um, pharmaceutical companies. These companies that you know, there's a very kind of linear process that of of manufacturing something quite complicated. Um, or a managing a complicated process like boarding an aircraft with millions of people going through a, a, a big airport. And they've been very kind of intimately re- um, kind of, you know, pioneering com- computer-aided manufacture and this kind of relationship between cutting down the drawing package and actually what's fabricated at the end. And they've been... Um, pioneering kind of open source details, if you like. So all of the projects that their clients work on, all the details is openly and freely available and is shared amongst, you know, other people can go in and have a look at them. They've got these massive databases. And they were saying that at first, particularly with some of these clients that have got a lot of, you know, very highly protected IP, like you might have in pharmaceutical companies, they were like, there's no way that we're going to allow our buildings or details of our buildings to be freely available. Um, but over time, you know, the kind of clients began to see the value of it and that it wasn't a kind of, it wasn't as competitive as they thought it was. And actually the sharing of data between different projects and different clients actually meant that everybody increases and gets better faster. And actually that becomes quite an opportunity. And I thought that was quite enlightened thinking and they often use a lot of their kind of diagnostic computational data analysis tools not even for designing but for just helping clients diagnose problems and the clients find it so valuable that they've actually got a floor in their building which is just filled with kind of permanently located client representatives so, you know, they've got the, you know, BAA or someone working from Glasgow Klein Smith or something like that sitting on the floor, um, you know, amongst these architects, engineers, data scientists, um, computer engineers. Um, and the, the person from the, from the client side might have a particular operational problem and they take it to the architectural team or to the design team. And they're like, here's the problem. How can, what other ways can we look at this? And they kind of begin that dialogue where the result might not be a a kind of change in a physical asset, but it's an analytical dialogue using computational tools. And it's, it's fascinating. And what, what I'm hearing here or kind of speculating here, what you're talking about is Corbu actually becomes like the next level of that, where clients can kind of start to interface with a piece with, with your own AI generated assistant and kind of start creating that dialogue and producing ideas for you from the from the client side you can even imagine clients kind of subscribing to these bots um yep wow yep and now you're talking about the business of architecture and the opportunities at hand because are we being hired for the image we produce no we're being hired because someone has gotten a great recommendation of working mm-hmm. with an architect. And you need someone to, to handhold you through this million dollar new home that you're constructing, mm-hmm. that you're doing once in your life. And as good as AI gets, it's not gonna be the one that's actually holding your hand through that process. Mm-hmm. And the, the value of the architect is to come in with their uh, educated and learned opinion on what works in this specific situation. And do you need to be paying the architect their hourly fee, or does the architect need to eat away at their margin if the client wants to understand what a yellow couch could look like in the space, or what this specific lamp could look like, or what if the window moved over? Maybe, maybe the architect is there for that, but I think AI is (laughs) is where it starts to fit into the process. And the client can go to the architect who they're paying uh, a, a healthy fee for to say, hey, these are the designs I I came up with, with your architect, with your mm-hmm. AI, with your core boot. And now let's talk about it. And it goes both ways because if the architect is missing some information from the client, why can't there be a, an artificial client rep that is interacting with the client and gathering additional information just as the project 
is requesting this information. And, and I think there's, uh, you, you know, you mentioned, you know, subscribing to these artificial architects. Uh, I think that's a beautiful world because what you're doing is getting more people to enjoy that process of designing their dream home. Mm -hmm. And maybe today you can't afford an architect and you just want to see what it would be like to work with them. And if you have a subscribed artificial intelligence that represents how it would be to work with your firm, you, know, you were never going to work with someone who had a budget of $10,000, but perhaps they're willing to pay $100 just to interact what it would be like to work with you. Mm -hmm. And I, I think we have this lens of what are the opportunities here and use that creative education that we've all been taught of taking the opposing idea of AI is replacing us, right? And, mm -hmm. and well, we, we have value we're delivering. So how do you look at the two things of the, the, uh, the true value AI is bringing, which is the increase in this feedback loop and the true value we're bringing and then come up with that third idea. I, I think we just need to uh, continue to understand that this technology can be used to replace us. And there are companies that are quite literally trying to do that with the mm -hmm. tagline of fire your interior designer and let's remove the need for the architect and making all these crazy tools for the consumer. Mm -hmm. So our bet and what we believe is that the architect won't be replaced by AI. They will be amplified by the productivity gains and the business opportunities if you lean into that. I, uh, I, I, I think this, this is wonderful. And you know, one, one of the things that excites me about the possibility of, of AI in architecture, and again, it goes, goes back to what you were, your kind of proclamation of becoming, you know, returning back to the master builder. And yeah, there's, there's all these tools that are available that mean that the, the kind of churn grind work of the architect of making endless client iterations and changes doesn't need to happen by putting highly trained, expensive employees to do essentially glorified data entry. You know, this is a big, this is a big issue in, in the architecture profession is that we have very highly trained, expensive people doing very low level work. And it's infuriating for the architects, for the people who are doing it. And it's like, as a business practice, it's just difficult. It just becomes very difficult. So leaning into um, an AI solution um, is, is wonderful, is, you know, really, really starts to free up. I love this idea of, you know, kind of a subscription service that, that a client can have with your own very specially trained AI assistant as a way of marketing and being very proactive with your clients. I mean, we talk about here at Business of Architecture, um, you know, good marketeers, good salespeople are finding ways to circumvent, you know, um, the traditional routes to winning a project, i.e. institutional projects they'll go to and an RFP. And it's very reactionary. You know, the, the institution has already decided these key decisions. And then at some point, they've decided a budget, they've decided what they need. And then they go to, we need an architect to do X, Y, and Z. And by that point, a lot of the major strategic decisions have been made. The architect has been cut out, and now the architect is reduced to a position of just of just producing drawing collateral, which is undervalued, and there's a set price for it, and we're going to compete, you know, who can give us the lowest price. And it's just very unhealthy. Whereas something like this, you know, now you can use AI to supplement being proactive and reaching out to prospective clients and having them engage with a kind of advisory strategic consulting conversation with a AI assistant and they can kind of develop that relationship and the value is just being created up front, if you like. And then you can see it just being a very easy step to um, like a consulting service and then winning a larger project down the, down the back of the line. So, Love it. I mean, this is this is fascinating, fascinating stuff. Tell me a little bit about, um, you know, what you've done with Corbu in terms of getting it set up. What is it? What has it taken for you to be a startup founder, and all of the complications of raising finance and you know software development? And this is no. This is this is this is the the real stuff now. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, you know, the thing with, 
the thing with architecture and especially what you guys have done with the profession is uh, shed light on how to get going and to, to really push for, uh, yes, there's design and architecture, but there's also the business. And what does that look like? So I, I think when it came to setting up my own architecture practice, I had this template to follow. And I had very successful architects in, in my own personal network and mentors that I could lean on. Right. And they, we could talk about setting up the contract and, uh, you know, ask for the retainer just in case and, and all these small things that like you won't really think about when you first try it out. But uh, there were people who had done it. So when it comes to being a startup founder and creating a completely new company with a completely new idea, there are uh, templates that you see from different people in different industries but every problem you run into is unique. And there isn't a, oh, let's, let's look how this company addressed it. Because you're dealing with a new technology, uh, with new consumer behavior, with new business behavior, with new ideas. And y you can look to history to maybe help inform the decision, but a lot of it has to just come from trial and error and, and, and intuition. Uh, so fortunately, part of my own superpower is having that ability to sell. And what I had to do was come to Silicon Valley and talk to people who knew nothing about architecture and convince them that this is an idea worth pursuing. Mm. So we have a great tech or CTO who you know worked at Microsoft for a decade and uh, was doing enterprise AI before, and he knows nothing about architecture. But I had to approach him saying, hey, this is a really big idea, the really big opportunity, and it's serving, it's for an underserved industry. Because if you look at innovation in architecture, we have Autodesk, which doesn't really innovate. They are using underlying technology from the 1980s that takes years to learn. And I remember using their software. And after five years, I just was told a new command that would have saved me a year of my life. And that was so infuriating. Like, why wasn't this just told, you know, why didn't I know about this when I needed to know about it? And, uh, and I think, uh, you, you know, what I want to emphasize within the startup world and the tech scene in Silicon Valley is that we have a technology perfectly suited for underserved uh, industry. And the combination is not only like a beautiful and happy customer, it's also a beautiful and happy future when there's better architecture that's surrounding us. And, uh, you know, I, I would still say we're in the early days, right? You know, this technology came out a year ago, so we can only have been around for a year. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is something that has really turned into a passion of mine. And, you know, every day, the, the most enjoyable part is when we reach out to a new firm and we show them the magic of, of what Corbu can do and that beautiful future. And as they get excited, it, it excites us. Um, I, I think when it comes to, you know, finding people on the team, uh, there are uh, advisors who have built AI companies before that can kind of give you a business sense or, or help you think through these decisions. Um, uh, of course, you have uh, investors as well. And the approach we took was trying to partner with people that uh, understood that we're dealing with an industry that hasn't seen too many changes in their technology. So uh, the the approach you take might have to be slightly different compared to, uh, we, we call it fintech, but the financial service industry. Mm -hmm. um, are you, are you, is this a polite way of saying that architects are, are Luddites? I <laughs> love the profession and love anyone who, <laughs> who's, who's in it. I think uh, we all are aware of some biases and underlying sure. Um, you know, stigmas within the profession. Sure, sure. Um, you know, we're definitely here to, to find the people who are ready to live in the future. And as we get more people in the future, they're going to help pull everyone else kind of stuck in the past to that future with us. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think there's many traditional paths within architecture. And what you guys help shed light on is there are new and better ways to do things. So that's a similar mindset with how we approach our outreach to potential customers is, hey, I understand that you've been hand drafting for the last three decades and you can keep doing that. 
but what would it look like if you start to incorporate hand drafting with AI? Mm-hmm. Kind of encourage that creative muscle instead of that you know, initial fear or jealousy of what AI can bring. Amazing. Um, with the with with Corbu, for example, you've kind of started, you know, with a very practical application of AI um, around graphics and visual visual production. And then, you know, we've kind of been speculating here about what the what the future is. How does the business model for a startup firm work? Because it's very, diff- you know, it's very capital intensive. It's labor intensive to actually develop a piece of software, and then you've also got to figure out whether this software has market capability, or you know, is is you know, uh, it's not like you can sell one or two of the products. You've got to sell at a certain amount of scale. Plus, you've still got to be researching because the the software is un- is is uh, is probably coming up with new questions that are are of interest where you can apply the, the the kind of next area of play or discovery if you like can you tell us a little bit about how you have to manage this kind of dance and balance if you like and and what sorts of investors do you look for to to come in to help you do that because I'm, I'm assuming that investors who get involved at this kind of stage they understand that the the business is finding its you know your, your testing ideas basically yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so if you look at if you look at what the venture startup space looks for, it's mm-hmm. companies like Uber, mm-hmm. right? And it's this world changing, uh, ten, you know, twenty billion dollar company that can uh, add a lot of value to the world. That's probably changing the behavior. Um, a, a common theme we see is if you look at um, if you look at a service that wealthy people get and then figure out a way to democratize that you actually end up with a pretty big idea which quite literally is uber with private drivers mm-hmm. uh, home chef with having your own private chef um, and I, I do wonder what that looks like for architecture like if only the most wealthiest people can afford these uh, houses in Montecito with you know the, the world's best residential architects what does that process what does that process look like or what does that software look like if you kind of democratize access to, to great design and great designers. Mm-hmm. And that's, this is the discussion that we have with investors to make sure that uh, one, that they, they see a similar future where design isn't just for the, the rich and famous. I, I think we all mm-hmm. should have access to, to great design. Um, and also understand that, you know, you can't look at a startup as a spreadsheet. And what's your P and L, and what's the customer acquisition cost, and all this data? Because when you're early, you don't have any of that data. So the data points you do have to look at are who are the founders, you know, who are the people behind the team, uh, what's their resilience resiliency like? You know, are are they doing this because they have user empathy and understand the actual problem being solved, or are they doing this just uh, you know they, they saw an opportunity that they're trying to take advantage of? And, you know, for me, it's, it's something that, it's something that you can always uh, lean back on when you come from the industry, because I can only think of the endless nights I had in design school of where this software would help that. And all the students that have gone through that for the last three or four decades. And the exciting part is I think it's going to be very different for the next three or four decades and how students are taught education and and how the profession is practiced. So in these early days with investors, you you can talk about the business model and uh, subscription is like the having some sort of recurring revenue with a subscription is kind of that that Goldilocks zone for investors. Um, And and, and that comes with running a business and figuring out the value you're you're providing and quantifying it and and testing pricing points. but what we like to emphasize is that there, there's a bigger picture here and, and that a North star is what we need to be pushing towards. Um, and fortunately the investor is there to help you figure out some of that smaller data points to, you know, raise the first round and then get to the next round. And there are templates in other industries uh, that, that you can uh, look into help, help follow. Uh, another thing that came to mind earlier, which we didn't talk about is um, the, the firm in the UK that was 
open sourcing their details, right? Th this idea of open source is very uh, normal and common in the computer software space. And yeah. part of that is what leads to the innovation for these world-changing companies. And one of the stigmas in design and architecture is that you know, your, your designs, your data is super private, right? Like that, that's, that's like your, your uniqueness. And it, it can't be shared because this is your intellectual property. And, you know, if you share it and then someone uses it and then the building collapses, you get sued. And a lot of people kind of go to like the, the most extreme, uh, worst case example of what could happen. Mm -hmm. um, well, in software, you still have that. And the worst case example is someone builds code that has a backdoor into it that can lead to data issues and stealing people's information. And yet people still lean into the open source because that's how you progress these industries. Uh, so I think it's great that the, the company you brought up is kind of leaning into that idea of open source and letting others build off of what they're doing. Uh, uh, maybe wrapping it to, to what we were discussing earlier. I think having the alignment in some of these larger ideas and thoughts in the industry is like the number one thing you need to find, both for people that you bring on to your team, uh, from uh, an employee, from a co-founder, from an advisor, and of course, the investor. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then let's not forget the customer. I, I think architecture firms who see a brighter future ahead uh, are starting to adopt this technology. And you know, if we treat this as an opportunity to improve what's been done, then I think that uh, that, that future is and can be a lot brighter. Amazing. I think it's a perfect place for us to conclude the conversation there. Really fascinating stuff that you guys are doing. If people want to engage with Corbu, find out more about um, the, the, the software, um, what's the best way for them to do that? Yeah, they can reach me via email. Uh, it's taylor at corbu.ai. We'll, we'll put um, it in the, in the info. Yeah, yeah, you, you got that. Um, and you can check out our website. Uh, we're currently working with design partners that are helping craft the story and product of what we're building. Mm -hmm. Because what we don't want to happen is to approach companies with a product like Autodesk that's super complicated and you're, you're, not, you're not informing that, that product design. You know, we're approaching companies in the schematic design phase of the product where they actually get a say for what DD and CD looks like. Um, so if any of that is interested, is interesting to you, then please reach out. We're, we're always looking for people who are ready to live in the future. Amazing. Amazing. Really, really fascinating stuff there, Taylor. You, you excited me. So, uh, thank you very much. Real pleasure, um, speaking with you and, uh, I look forward to, speaking to you later on and seeing how everything is developing and the innovations that you uh, continue to produce. So thank you so much for your time today. Of course, this was very enjoyable and looking forward to talking soon. And that's a wrap. And one more thing, if you haven't already, please do head on over to iTunes or Spotify and leave us a review. We'd love to read your name out here on the show and we'd love to get your feedback and we'd love to hear what it is that you'd like to see more of and what you love about the show already. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Hello listeners, we hope you're enjoying our show. We love bringing you these insightful conversations, but we couldn't do it without the support of our amazing sponsors. If you're a business owner or know someone who would be an excellent fit for our audience, we'd love to hear from you. Partnering with us means your brand will reach over 40,000 engaged listeners each month. Interested in becoming a sponsor? Please send us an email at support at businessofarchitecture.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.